So welcome to our October Linguistics Colloquium. I'm glad to see so many of you joining us today, and I hope that you've all been staying safe and healthy. As you know, the virus is spreading very quickly right now, so please remember if you have any symptoms at all, stay home and get well. Don't come to campus or go anywhere else where you risk getting someone else sick, okay? Now, let me introduce to you our speaker for today. Dr. David Beard is an assistant professor in the Department of Modern Languages, Linguistics, and Intercultural Communication at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, which is also known as UMBC. Before joining UMBC in 2019, he was an assistant professor at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. And there he worked in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese from 2015 until 2019. Incidentally, this, his time in Ohio overlapped with my own and our, our paths actually did cross in 2017, not in Ohio, but at the Kentucky Foreign Languages Conference at the University of Kentucky in Lexington. At that conference, he and his students had been scheduled to present their research in the same session that my students and I were also scheduled to present in on actually a very similar topic. So he and I met then and got to know each other fairly well back then. Dr. Beard has a PhD in Hispanic linguistics from UC Davis, where his dissertation investigated bilingual word recognition involving cognates. Since then, he's published several papers on bilingualism, second language acquisition, and language pedagogy, focusing particularly on orthographic and phonological effects in visual word recognition. Of particular note is that Dr. Beard was invited to give a plenary speech last year at the APEC conference in Quebec, Canada. We are fortunate to have him speaking to us today. He'll be speaking about his recent research on L2 influence on L3 word recognition. And the title of his talk is, I know Spanish, which ro romance language should I learn next? So let's give Dr. Beard a warm welcome, maybe in the form of a virtual applause or a thumbs up. Dr. Beard, the time is now yours. All right, good afternoon to everyone. Can I get a quick thumbs up uh, just that you can hear me still? Oh, fantastic. Um, so um, why don't I see if I can actually use technology today, uh, share my screen with you and then I'll say a few words and then begin our presentation today. Okay. So how are we looking? Okay, here, are we, uh, are we seeing the title screen to the presentation? Yes, I am. Oh, that's outstanding. Um, I uh, actually teach classes on language and technology but that doesn't actually mean that it's going to, uh, to work for me. So um, again, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, first and foremost, I just want to, uh, to thank you very much for um, one, to, I wanna thank Scott Jarvis for inviting me to, to give this talk. And I wanna just thank all of you for, for tuning in, uh, signing in um, from your homes or wherever you may be. Um, this pandemic has certainly taken uh, a toll on us, sometimes maybe more than, than, than others. But um, if how our students are doing this semester is any reflection of uh, the general population, um, we're pretty stressed, uh, anxiety levels are high, our workloads in our classes are high, um, and we're just really doing our best, I think, to survive. So um, just thank you all very much for, for coming to this, for the, to this talk. Um, I really do appreciate it, and I'm, I'm very grateful to be able to present to you uh, today. Um, like I said, my, or actually like, like Scott said, my name is David Beard. Um, you can call me David or whatever rolls off the tongue easiest, uh, no big qualms there. 
why don't we uh, we jump into this presentation and let's see if I can work this technology here. All right, so what I'm going to present today, uh, I know Spanish, which Romance language should I learn next? L2 influence on L3 word recognition. Um, I have a lot to say about this project. Um, anything from the uh, participants uh, to the uh, researchers to the topic at hand. Um, as you can see, uh, I, uh, or we actually published uh, preliminary results on this when we looked at um, differences between uh, Portuguese and Italian in relation to Spanish. And we did this at the proceedings of the uh, conference in the Interna uh, International Conference on the Mental Lexicon. Uh, it's a really nice conference that's held every other year and somewhere in Canada. And it's um, generally computational linguistics, psycholinguistics, and neurolinguistics that are, uh, are those fields coming together to look at uh, the lexicon. Um, so it's, it's quite an interesting uh, conference, but they also have opportunities for uh, junior researchers to publish as well as senior researchers to publish too. So um, you might have read this very brief article we put together as part of the proceedings. If you did, that's great. If not, no worries. What I'm going to present on today actually is um, that project continued. So we've taken that project and we are now looking at French as well as Romanian. And so we're asking ourselves, hey, if I know Spanish, uh, which Romance language should I learn next? Um, I have a choice of four now. Uh, before I hop into the content of my talk, um, I wanted to provide my contact info. Again, my name is David Beard. You can see where I'm at. There's my email, uh, my Twitter handle, as well as my phone. Um, I do this at the beginning of, of every semester with my students, and I'm, I'm happy to do it with all of you here. Uh, if you think that I might be able to be of help in some way because of the topics I'm investigating, because of something that I'm doing today, um, just please feel free to contact me. Um, I want to do my best to mentor uh, junior scholars as much as I can. Um, I'm still kind of one myself, uh, but that's important to me. We have some time after this talk uh, just to chat, but in case you're not uh, able to hang out, um, here's the info um, to get a hold of me, okay? So let's, uh, let's see what we're looking into. So a little bit of a, of a preface. What I'm interested in here is uh, using pre-existing knowledge to develop new skills. Uh, this is not something new. Um, it's been done in cognitive psychology for a long time, looking at the difference between beginners and experts. Um, and it looks like uh, beginners and experts, when they look at the same stimulus, uh, they process it in a different way. And applying this to language uh, and learning a second language, we already uh, have knowledge of a first language. This is uh, a truism. Um, but what that first language does with or how that first language affects the acquisition or our development of a second language, um, that's interesting to me. If you look at uh, ACTFL, um, if you think about language pedagogy and developing second language proficiency, um, they have proficiency guidelines, but they also have specific uh, groups in which they've put languages into, and they estimate based on, if you know English, it'll take you X amount of months, hours, etc., to uh, acquire um, group one, and then of course it's going to be more hours for group two. And so what I'm getting at here is it seems that the first language we have um, has effects on uh, the second language we want to learn. And then maybe the second language we learn also has an effect on the third language we, uh, we want to learn. Uh, nothing too magnanimous or novel, um, but I just want to kind of set this up. Um, I'm an applied linguist, so you can see um, kind of my ideas. And what I'm doing is conceptualizing language very much in the sense of those objects that we name, like English, Spanish, and without getting into any theoretical linguistics, um, this would be uh, considered uh, an externalist approach as opposed to like an internalist approach, okay? So um, I, I don't know if I'm lazy. Uh, I try to be efficient, but I also, uh, I wanna use all the resources I have at hand to acquire whatever new information comes my way. Uh, so, 
we can ask ourselves, if you want to learn Spanish, let's say you know English, what words can you already recognize? Um, we can start at the top, and these are all words actually in Spanish. Um, so let's just look at them, right? And it works well that we're looking at the screen. Uh, the actual medium we're working in here is visual word recognition. So if things are done in the auditory realm, we might expect different results. The first word here, um, animal, then we have papel, efecto, actriz, árbol. Um, and I think you probably were able to um, either guess or kind of already know that the first word was animal in English, the second word was paper, the third word was effect. The fourth word, maybe, it's getting a little bit more opaque, it's less transparent, uh, it's actress, right? And then the last one, we actually can't use the form there at all to, uh, to get to the word tree in English, but maybe you took Latin and you know that, or um, you can think of maybe, or you, your uh, lexical richness is, is high, and you're thinking of uh, arboretum and other um, words that begin with arbor, something like that, right? Uh, so what I'm kind of getting at, can we use orthography as a way into a language? Uh, I work in language learning and learning and language teaching. Uh, so I, I work with teachers a lot and they're interested in um, providing the best materials they can to their students, right? And I'm also interested in how we learn uh, just generally and specifically related to language. So it's kind of a win-win situation. Um, what can these overlapping patterns uh, tell us about learning something? And then of course, uh, down the line, teaching that, that something. Um, the inspiration for, for this project actually came over the summer. Uh, I've taught uh, history of the Spanish language several times. We teach this class in Spanish. And the uh, external history in which we talk about cultural and social changes throughout, you know, 2,500 years. It's a lot of history, but it's pretty uh, intuitive and or uh, accessible. The internal part of the history, though, dealing with, uh, uh, say, phonetic changes and, uh, yeah, say phonetic changes from Latin forward, right, looking at, uh, at that. Um, Students always have a part on the, on, the, on the second exam in which they get a word in Latin. They need to, based on the rules they've learned, um, apply those rules and derive a word in Spanish. Students are like notoriously really, really bad at this. Um, I was really, really bad at this when I first started doing this uh, as a student. And I actually don't think it's just that we're a second language learners of Spanish. I took a course, History of the Spanish Language at the University of Salamanca in Spain with Spaniards. And this is the most failed course uh, in, that, um, in that department for that semester. It's, it's a guarantee. So it, why is that though, right? Like, uh, it, depending on who you ask, like Latin is Spanish, right? I mean, it's it's... It's Latin 2,000 years later. But uh, what happened here? So theoretically, everything we're looking at here uh, are cognates. And the idea with cognates, words that are translations of one another, and they also share some sort of orthographic or phonological overlap, you can also, they can also have uh, the same root, right? Um, man, they just changed like so much from Latin to Spanish that uh, maybe if we looked at like each change, like take the first example, platea from Latin, and the idea is like it started to change and it went from platea to platia, plaza, and then eventually plaza or plaza, right? Um, but students will usually guess uh, plata means silver. Um, I would guess though that um, when these changes were actually taking place, right? That the speakers of, of platea, when they started hearing platia, that wasn't too big of a shift. It was only changing, um, not the entire uh, word, but just a small portion of it. But then by the time when we jump several steps forward, um, it seems a rather opaque. So it looks like we can use orthography to get into languages. Um, we're gonna talk about cognates and, and why they're important. Uh, but here we have different types of cognates. Some of them are more uh, easily recognizable, like number three, uh, vinya, like a vine, for instance, right? Um, but anyways, what, what I'm looking at here is 
as a learner, you come in across a lot of words. And some of these words uh, look similar to other words. Some look very different. And uh, what's it like processing these words, right? So uh, couldn't get uh, out of the presentation, you know, without doing a meme. Uh, so with this, uh, this character, D in this series, uh, it's sunny in Philadelphia. She's about, she's reading instructions in Spanish and she's about to inject her brother with Botox. Um, and she says, yeah, but you know, if you know Latin, you know, like three languages. And he follows up by saying, and you don't know Latin, right? And she says, no, but, um, and the inspiration for this project came from seeing students, uh, struggling to process words from Latin into Spanish, uh, even though they were ideally, they were kind of cognates. And then also that you can look in pop culture and there's a lot of references that Latin connects you to a lot of other languages. Uh, there's an episode of The Simpsons in which uh, Homer actually, uh, he gets a computer and of course, and the internet and Homer's very dangerous with both of those things. He starts a blog and he says that Spanish and Italian are the same language. Um, they're not, but there's a reason why we were willing to believe that and not Spanish and Mandarin or Spanish and German, for instance. There's sort of a cultural perception that there are similarities there between these languages. So um, if there are similarities between these, between these languages, um, how do these languages interact uh, when we learn uh, when we learn another language, right? When we know a first language and we learn a second language. Or in this case, if we know two languages and we're interested in learning a third, uh, what kind of advantages advantages do we have at the uh, onset of that, right? So um, for years, uh, people talked about, I think like a Weinreich in 1953, talked about interference. Other people talked about transfer and then eventually influence. And if you really wanna know uh, about this topic, uh, this is just one book, Cross Linguistic Influence in Language and Cognition. Uh, this is probably the best picture I've ever seen in my life. And I just want to compliment uh, Scott and also congratulate him. Um, I think he was awarded an honorary doctorate here. And that is just, uh, wow, that's really uh, admirable and that's, that's amazing. Um, you guys have access to uh, a great scholar and a very knowledgeable person of these topics. I don't think it takes uh, too much convincing then to understand that uh, languages that, are, that we know uh, relate to one another somehow in the head, okay? Without any, making any strong claims. Um, why are we even investigating vocabulary? Just real quick, if I'm learning another language, uh, how many words do I need to know? Uh, that's a pretty important thing. So uh, Robert Blake and Eve Isaac, they, they speak about this in learning uh, vocabulary in a second language. They talk about word frequency, collocations, and cognates being kind of three types of words or uh, ideas when we're learning uh, when we're learning vocabulary to pay attention to. So first and foremost, they say like word frequency is big because if we know, well, we need to know about three thousand to eight thousand words. Uh, we mean word families, right? Like lemmas, uh, to read independently in a language. So it would really behoove us to know the most frequent words when we're acquiring a new language. That helps for sure. Uh, collocations help as well, but I won't speak about them today. And then cognates also help. So the idea here being, if you have a language with more cognates, uh, that's gonna facilitate learning in some way. Um, there's a lot of reasons to pick cognates. I mean, there's a ton. Uh, just a couple to pick, uh, between English and Spanish, um, working with students that are learning uh, Spanish as a second language, or heritage speakers that are working in English, for instance, uh, about one third of the words in academic texts, so working with students to acquire academic competencies, um, those are English-Spanish cognates. And uh, there are false cognates too, but this only makes up about six or 7% of the words. Um, this is pretty significant, right? So, um, Teachers have known for years that we, can, that we can use cognates to facilitate learning. Uh, we look at a word like we did animal or papel or efecto before. We're like, oh yeah, I, kinda, I think I kind of know that, right? And then really cool, um, patients, bilingual aphasics that have undergone uh, therapy 
uh, tend to recollect cognates more than non-cognates. So if we know two languages and they have words that overlap, uh, it seems that those words are stored kind of in a special way or maybe processed in a special way. Uh, this is relevant to psycholinguistics um, because research about uh, the lexicon and bilinguals. Um, wow, for uh, the last couple of decades, at least that I've been that I, that I can tell, um, has been trying to uh, address whether uh, we can kind of activate uh, both languages when we hear a signal, or whether one language is kind of suppressed when we get input. Right. Um, you can call it non-selective or selective access. And the idea with selective or non-selective access is that uh, I can select my access. So I get the input signal and there's kind of a one processing, uh, one path basically um, from that input signal to one specific language. And then the non-selective understanding would just be that um, I get the input signal and maybe both languages are competing to, uh, to tell me what that signal means, right? And in, in competing, they interact in some way, making the access more or less non-selective until like the last stage in which you make a decision, right? And you say it was English or it was Spanish, something like that. Um, as best as I can tell though, the, the, the discussion right now isn't really saying like, hey, can bilinguals turn off a language? It's basically saying, hey, uh, look at what the bilingual is doing. Like, let's look at the task that we're, we're performing. Uh, if we're writing, if we're reading, uh, what, what is the content of the input? Um, and that might affect uh, whether we select, uh, have selective or non-selective access based on, on certain task demands. Uh, and then maybe we can just kind of zoom in or zoom out, right, of these languages. Either way though, they're, they're connected, right? So. Um, I did mention, but this is Francois Guachot, a uh, well-known researcher in, um, in psycholinguistics, um, quite famous book, The Psycholinguistics of Bilingualism, in which he addresses uh, everything I just mentioned, but in much more detail, and of course, much more uh, cogently. Um, we're going to be looking at reaction times in this study. So I'm going to show you some results that are from an experiment we, we did. And so just a few words about reaction times, if you're not used to, uh, to looking at them, or if you're not used to thinking about how you could construct an experiment uh, with reaction times. Uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, this is coming out of, well, uh, earlier in physiology in the late 19th century, but really in cognitive psychology in the 20th century, this is used a lot, right? So we're um, thinking that uh, reaction times reflect some sort of processing. Simple tasks correlate with short reaction times and complex tasks correlate with long reaction times. Um, they can put people in a lab and time your reaction time to solve mathematical equations. As you increase the complexity of the mathematical equation, you'll, it'll take you longer. Cognitive psychologists might be interested if that's like a linear function or a curvy linear function or something cool like that. But I just want us to think about reaction times as though um, if it takes us a little bit longer, there's a little bit more processing involved. Okay, uh, we can see that with language in example B. So um, if you prime someone uh, with nurse and then gave them a target nurse, right? So you show them the word nurse, then the next word you show them was nurse uh, and you had them react right? as soon as they saw the, the second uh, word, this is the second, uh, once they saw the target nurse, um, we would expect a quick reaction in relation to number two in which you have nurse and doctor um, now we still have semantic association, right? Nurse will prime doctor, um, but we don't have the exact uh, identity prime that we had in number one. And then number three, uh, nurse and pasta, um, there's not a specific semantic association between nurse and pasta. I think I was just hungry when I came up with that example. And the idea here is that it's a little bit more complex. Uh, the prime has you access nurse, and then you're uh, given the target pasta. And maybe you need to back out of the lexical entry nurse and then activate pasta, right? So it's going to take you a little bit more time. So again, the inspiration for this study kind of came from history of the Spanish language and historical linguistics. And I'm combining some work that was done in historical linguistics with uh, my own work, which is on language processing, uh, psycholinguistic-esque, I guess. Um, 
And this is a chart of lexical similarity. So lexical similarity, historical linguists have used this uh, for years to assess uh, the similarity between two languages to see if they're the um, part of the same language family, part of the same variety, are the same language, et cetera, right? You can think of getting uh, like a Swadesh list of like 200 very common words, uh, things like hand, tree, uh, mouth, I don't know. There's a, a list though. And when you compare that across languages, uh, look at the form overlap. And that's what historical linguists using the uh, comparative method had done for years. And so you can go to like ethnologue, uh, Wikipedia, and check a uh, chart on lexical similarity. And it's based on orthography, right? They don't have access to the, the way this sounds. They just got documents and they're reviewing things. This is cool. So we actually began hypothesizing based on these values. So we thought like, all right, uh, if we have to uh, compare languages and compare lexicons, it looks like Portuguese has a overlap of 0.89 with the idea that 89% of the uh, lexical items in Portuguese uh, are shared with Spanish. 82% of Italian is shared with Spanish, 75% uh, of French, about 30% of English, but this is not from ethnologue. It's from a previous uh, citation I had with the benefit of cognates. And then about 71% of the lexicon in Romanian is shared with Spanish. So we thought, ooh, well, if cognates work to facilitate, there's even a cognate facilitation effect in psycholinguistics, CFE. If that works, uh, all we gotta do is like align these uh, measures and they should correlate. It's gonna work. So that's kind of what we thought, right? Um, but there's more to it. One quick sec. So, Remember I talked about types of cognates. So we looked at Latin and we looked at words like uh, vinea, which will give something like vinia in Spanish as, as a pair, uh, uh, in comparison to other words like platea, which gives plaza, but it's less transparent, right? Well, if we're dealing with types of cognates only in one language, they're looking at Spanish, right? I imagine that cognates might behave differently between languages. So if I think about Spanish and I look at cognates in Portuguese or I look at cognates in French, maybe there's like more overlap with Portuguese than there is with French or something like that. And we need a way to quantify this. We used uh, what's called a Levenstein distance and it's just a metric to assess the difference between two strings of characters. Uh, it was constructed in 1965, I think, by Vladimir Levenstein. Uh, this computer scientist and he wanted to measure the distance between uh, exactly this two strings of characters um so we can see in example a they go from rain to shine right and to do that they make three changes they make two substitutions we see in blue and they make uh, one insertion we see in green so then we would assign that uh, a, a number and it would be 11 sign distance of three um we see in example c that there's going to be four um, edits that are made. And so there's a Levenstein distance of four. And again, what we're trying to get at is uh, there's a correlation between uh, reaction time and the perceived similarity of the target. So if, if the target is, is perceived to be less similar, the reaction time should increase. It would be a longer reaction time. How did we do this? So let me just uh, check in real fast on Zoom to see how we're doing, um, make sure my connection hasn't failed. Um, everyone seems to still be there. All right, continuing on. How did we do this? So um, this is a, a methodology within, uh, I'd say within psycholinguistics, a uh, pretty, pretty common one. Let's start off with the participants. Then we'll talk about the materials we used, and then we'll walk you through the procedure, okay? So we had 90 participants in total, uh, mean age of 20, uh, 20 years. First language is English. They have no experience with learning other languages besides Spanish. Spanish is not spoken at home, and undergraduate students majoring or minoring in Spanish, and they're currently enrolled in a Spanish class uh, where Spanish is spoken. 
these are students in upper division classes. So it's not that they're Spanish classes, but they are uh, content classes in which they might be reading literature or doing linguistics with me. Uh, and we'll be doing that in Spanish. Um, their second language is Spanish. They have a proficiency level of, uh, of intermediate, which is a pretty wide proficiency level, but still. Um, and participants, they were paid to complete these experiments. So, all right. Um, materials we used. So we used a couple desktop computers, the software E-Prime 3.0, which lets us set up and design experiments and then implement them. Uh, gives us an output and then we can process that uh, with a statistical analysis, right? And a Kronos button box. These are cool little boxes that have just buttons on them and they're very precise in recording reaction times uh, to the millisecond. This is really important because all of the work we're doing here is happening in fractions of a second. So um, you can think about the scale that we're working on. Uh, we had 60 words, uh, 60 words total. 30 cognates to the Spanish primes in French, Italian, Portuguese, and Romanian. 30 non-cognates to the Spanish primes in French, Italian, Portuguese, and Romanian. None of the words are cognates with English. This is important because we want to know the effect of Spanish on learning their third language, not specifically English, right? So we had to actually eliminate any overlap we had with, with English. Um, and the word list is controlled for frequency uh, and word length. Um, they're all floating around 20, I think the frequency per million is like around 20 words. Um, anyways, to give you an example of the, uh, words they saw, here's one sample of a non-cognate. So think about 60 words, right? Um, in Spanish, 30 of them are cognates, 30 are non-cognates, and those serve as primes. And then there'll be a target in the corresponding language. So we have the prime, like the non-cognate, like basura, and then the non-cognates in each of the languages. And then we have um, cognate uh, tristeza, and then the cognates across. We actually saw a tristeza earlier, uh, not sadness, but just the word, um, because we got tristitia, right, from Latin. So this is, uh, I guess if we included Latin in here too, just for fun, uh, but we didn't. Okay, so. What's the full procedure? Um, as a participant, you would come to the lab. Uh, you're given five minutes to study vocabulary. So you get a list of 60 words in Spanish, 30 cognates, 30 non-cognates, and their translation in one of the languages. You're just randomly assigned to one language when you come into the lab. So it's not that participants complete the same task in four languages, um, but that you come in and you complete the task um, only in Portuguese or only in Italian. So you're getting Spanish primes no matter what, but the targets are gonna uh, change here. So complete a numerical string memory test. So after you studied for five minutes, uh, we had you do a visual digit span test. Um, then you perform the translation recognition task, which I'll, uh, which I'll explain in the next slide. And that's our main experiment we're looking at. And you completed an NBAC test next, and then you did a production task. What we did was just give you the, um, give you a list of the words in Spanish and you needed to translate them, all 60 of them, into the target language. Uh, you can imagine this is a much more difficult task than just the comprehension task we, we, we asked participants to perform. Um, the real thing we're interested in here, guys, is the translation recognition task. So uh, we thought working memory, if you could remember a lot of items at once, that also might help you perform well on the translation recognition task, right? You get a, a list of words. You can remember those words better than I can because I, I just can only remember a few items at once. That makes sense. But none of those correlated. So the, the NBAC test and the visual digit span, they, they're not uh, significant covariates in the model at all. Uh, and then they just kind of worked to get people to think about something else in the meantime, right? So they got the word list. They did something else, which they were very involved in. And then they got the main task translation recognition that we're interested in. The uh, vocabulary task, that one is really just to correlate with the translation recognition task. Um, so what is the translation recognition task? So again, um, think about completing this experiment yourself, right? So you would be sitting at a computer 
uh, you would have a button box in front of you and you only have two buttons, um, one button on the left and one button on the right. And you're gonna see a fixation cross. We can see on the upper right uh, corner of the screen here for 500 milliseconds. It's just like a heads up, like, hey, uh, something's coming, pay attention. And then you get the prime in Spanish. So one of those 60 words, right, is what you're gonna get. And then you get that for half a second. And then you get uh, the target screen and you have two words in Portuguese. One of them is a translation of the Spanish prime. And the other one is not. And you need to respond as quickly and accurately as possible. Um, and again, you have a left button and a right button. And that corresponds with the word on the left side of the screen, you'll press the left button. And a word on the right side of the screen, you'll press the right button. If that's the correct translation of the Spanish prime you just saw. Um, again, it's called translation recognition task. And there are various controls we implemented to ensure that we would not get uh, um, results with new effects that we didn't want to measure, uh, I guess. So again, reaction times and accuracy are measured. I can go back into this, but this is uh, just a lot of math about balancing everything. Uh, and it's pretty typical in, uh, I think, uh, psycholinguistic experiments at least. Okay, so a word of caution. We're going on to the results now. These are preliminary. Uh, what I did was look at the data and I removed uh, data points that I knew were outliers on the low end, right? So when we look at reaction times, um, think about this. Like if you get a word on the screen, it takes you time to process that word. It has to go, um, oh, I mean, it has to uh, hit your retina, go uh, through the optic nerve into the thalamus. Uh, it's projected to the visual cortex. It goes through various uh, areas in the visual cortex here in the occipital lobe before it makes its way lateralized over to the left into some word recognition area, right? Uh, so if you're getting a response of like five milliseconds or whatnot, that seems impossible. Uh, it usually takes about 200 milliseconds for us to even recognize and be able to react, meaning execute a motor function. Uh, so any responses under 250 milliseconds in this case, we just eliminated. Well, I'm saying this because um, there's still some outliers in the upper end. So I think when I look at each one of those individually uh, by subject and by, uh, by word that we looked at, by item, um, the results might look a little bit different. Hopefully they'll just be cleaner, but we'll, uh, let's take a look. So what research questions were we getting at? There's four that we're really interested in. Um, is there a difference in reaction time between languages? So you get the prime in Spanish, right? And then you get the target in one of four languages. Um, is there a difference in reaction time between these languages? Uh, two, is there a difference in reaction time between word types? Uh, so you can think about cognates and non-cognates. Remember, half the words were cognates, half were non-cognates. And so we know about the cognate facilitation effect. Uh, does that occur here? Okay. Re uh, research question number three. Is there a difference in reaction time between cognates across languages? So if we look at reaction times only to the cognates, right? So we have the four languages, but only the cognates in those four languages. Uh, do we notice a difference in reaction time between those? And if we do, like, why is that? Um, I, uh, I guess, spoiler alert, but I'm going to pitch something about Levenstein distance that I mentioned earlier. Um, and then research question four, does Levenstein distance affect reaction to targets? Remember, I had this idea that uh, lower Levenstein distance, uh, like nurse, nurse, right, with no edits, that would be a really fast reaction time, a short reaction time but something with um, growing a Levenstein distance, like we did from animal and animal, to paper and papel, to effect and efecto, to actress and actriz. That goes from zero, one, two, three, across those, those words we used earlier. All right, let's take a look. Um, oh, nope, not yet. I guess we wanted to hypothesize. So I've hypothesized that um, perceived similarity results in faster reaction time. So what we, what we think is gonna happen is we're gonna have the lowest reaction times in Portuguese, then Italian, then Romanian, then French. 
Or if you look at the lexical similarity measures, 89% of the lexicon shared, 82%, 71%, 75%. Uh, The issue here in why we don't have French ranked above Romanian, because it actually shares more um, lexical similarity with Spanish, is that we don't think lexical similarity uh, captures orthographic reforms through the centuries. So what we had to do was look at orthographic changes from uh, Latin into each one of these Romance languages, right? And so that's what we hypothesized. That's why we see the, the shift and we don't rank French higher. Um, so I'm arguing here for another, another metric. And if we include Levenstein distance as a predictor of what I'm calling perceived similarity with reduced Levenstein distance correlating to a shorter reaction time, then the hypothesis that more similar equals faster reaction time makes more sense. So what we have is the ordering like we had before, Portuguese, Italian, Romanian, French, but instead of associating the lexical similarity measures, what we have here are the Levenstein distance measures uh, averaged for uh, cognates in each of these languages, each of these languages. So you have 2.2, meaning that Portuguese cognates have an averaged Levenstein distance between Spanish of 2.2, whereas French on the high end has has an average Levenstein distance of 3.7. Again, this is just the cognates we're looking at here. That's our hypothesis. Let's check it out. All right, so got a little drink of water there and to go. So um, research question one, is there a difference in reaction time between languages? Let's take a look. Well, we have the four languages here. Uh, I'm looking at French on the left, and it looks like it has um, an average reaction time. I should actually explain things. It might be moving a little bit fast. I'm sorry. On the y-axis is uh, reaction time, and it's the average reaction time for that language across um, all uh, observations. So the average reaction time for cognates and non-cognates in French was uh, 1176 milliseconds, right? Or like Uh, 1.176 seconds. So to me, is there a difference in reaction time between languages? Uh, I mean, if I'm just looking at this in observation, there seems to be a, a difference between French and the rest of them, but I don't see anything super significant between Italian, Portuguese, and Romanian. Um, I put a NOVA uh, on this thing because the way we form that question, right, kind of yes or no, are there differences, yay or nay, um, we're kind of forming this question because of years of using um, an analysis of variance to do our, our, our modeling. Um, but I think we can ask a, a, a little bit different of a question and, and, and get, I, I hope, uh, more insights. So rather than is there a difference, uh, don't worry, we'll, we'll treat that. Uh, how does the language of the target affect reaction time? This makes more sense to me. So like, how does the language of the target affect reaction time? Maybe um, based on the language you get, right, it's going to increase or decrease the reaction time. Okay, so that's research question number one. What about research question number two? Is there a difference in reaction time between word types? In other words, condition. So now we're looking at cognates and non-cognates. And again, on the y-axis, we have the reaction time. On the x-axis, we have the condition. And we have cognates in red, non-cognates in blue. Um, This is pretty clear, actually. So if we were to just perform an ANOVA, we would, uh, with some confidence, be able to look at this and say, "Uh, I don't see error bars overlapping. These look like different distributions to me. I think there's an effect of word type. So I think we're getting a cognitive facilitation effect here. But then we can also ask, right, like how does the word type affect reaction time? So what does it do to reaction time? And how much does it affect reaction time? If we use something called a linear mixed effects model, um, which I won't explain very much of at all, um, partly because of time, and um, I can I can happily go into uh, explaining what I can after the talk though, uh, this should yield uh, a better analysis for us because we're taking into account the fixed effects we're looking for, meaning we're looking for language and we're we're looking for cognate meaning condition, 
And it takes into account the random effects that we just can't help. So we have different subjects, right, that are responding. And we also have different uh, words that are being responded to. Uh, so maybe we can uh, include those in a model, which ANOVA cannot do. We can only include the fixed effects in, in, in ANOVA. And we can account for more of the variance, which is always a cool thing to do in stats. So research question number one and two, what we did was a linear mixed effects model. And to answer research question number one, is there a difference in reaction time between languages? Um, no. And how do we know this? Well, how do we read these results? Let's take a look here, okay? So we have a table and it shows predictors on the left and you see the intercept here. Just replace the intercept with language French. So I, I could have fixed that, but I want us to know that this is sort of like a baseline mean. Uh, this is what we would expect, right? And um, because uh, the software I'm using R processes things alphabetical, it just made the baseline mean French. So it shows this. It says, this is the intercept, meaning French. Woo! Oh, got a little bit scared there. This is the intercept, um, meaning French. And then we have each language down below. The condition, and we're only seeing the non-cognate condition. And then the Levenstein distance we included in the model. Um, and the estimates here, the next column we're looking at, the idea here is that these are the estimates not on the sample we looked at, but we took the sample of data that we collected and we formed estimates thinking that, hey, in the population, this is what we would expect. Um, and we see something like 973.99. So what that's telling us is um, we didn't change the metric. This is still in reaction times. And this just says that um, Average across French, I would expect a reaction time of uh, 973 or 974 milliseconds. And then what's cool, right, to get at our, our second research question, how does the word type affect uh, reaction time? We go down language, right, and we see that language Italian minus 126. The idea here is that in relation to this 973, so going from French to Italian, uh, you actually uh, have a shorter reaction time of 126 milliseconds. Going from French to Portuguese, about 156 uh, millisecond boost, and then about 159 millisecond boost going to Romanian. But you can see in the far column on the right, where we have a p-value, we're looking for a p-value of 0.05 or less, um, and neither of these figures within language meet that. So that's why we answer uh, no to our first research question. And we, then we look to our second research question about word type. And this is cool, right? So do we have a cognate facilitation effect? Uh, yeah, we do. It looks like for non-cognates, um, it takes uh, an additional 102 or 103 milliseconds to recognize non-cognates. So if you get a Spanish prime and then your target comes up, if that target is a non-cognate, it's going to take you an additional about 100 milliseconds to recognize it. Um, yeah, and that's about what I have to say here. Research question three. Is there a difference in reaction time between cognates across languages? So now we actually ditched the non-cognates, and we're only looking at the cognates. We look at four bars we have here. Uh, for each language. But again, this is uh, comparing cognates in French to cognates in Italian to cognates in Portuguese, cognates in Romanian. Uh, you can see the reaction times in milliseconds there. Um, and we ask ourselves the ANOVA question, is there a difference? Uh, yeah, I would say yes, um, between French and the rest of them, but that the rest of them, Italian, Portuguese, and Romanian, there's no difference, I would assume. Uh, how does reaction time to cognates change by language? Well, I want to know that. That's really interesting. So let's take a look. Uh, oh, bonus question, 3.5. Why is there a difference between reaction time to cognates across languages? So now I wanted to bring Levenstein distance back into it. Remember that we started with Levenstein distance and we thought that lower Levenstein distance, shorter reaction time, longer uh, reaction time, that would correlate with a higher Levenstein distance. So let's take a look at these back and forth. Right, so this is uh, cognates and the reaction times. And then the next one 
here, what we're looking at is just uh, average Levenstein distance from Spanish. And so we see the lowest uh, Levenstein distance at 2.2 for Portuguese. We go and look at the Portuguese reaction times and they're the lowest. Okay. So the Levenstein distance is doing something. Um, question four, does it do anything? I, wow, I anticipated what I was going to say. Amazing. All right. So um, how does Levenstein distance affect reaction to cognates? These are the two questions we're working with. Uh, does it affect? Uh, yes, it does. How does it affect? Well, let's check this out. Uh, this chart or this uh, graph here shows us uh, Levenstein distance on the x-axis. Sorry about that. Shows us Levenstein distance on the x-axis. And we move from the bottom left, zero Levenstein distance, so zero edits, no change, identical word. And we go out to the right and we increase Levenstein distance. And on the y-axis, we're looking at reaction time again. And so as we go up, we're increasing reaction time. And you guys can see that um, there's just an increase as we continue to um, incre increase in reaction time as we increase Levenstein distance, okay? There's that positive correlation. So running uh, again, a linear mixed effects model on this in which we look for the fixed effects and we look for the random effects, in, we include those into the model. Um, is there a difference in reaction time between cognates? Uh, yes, there is. French cognates are perceived as different from the other three languages. How do we know this? Uh, we can look up at our chart again. Remember, we have predictors and estimates. So let's look at our, our estimates, and it's predicting um, the intercept here, French cognate is going to be 973. And then as we, um, as we move down, sorry, uh, language to Italian. So in Italian cognate, you get a boost of about 160 milliseconds over a French cognate. Uh, in Portuguese, you get a boost of about 190 milliseconds over a French cognate. And in Romanian, about 180 milliseconds. We check the right column uh, for p-values, and we see that um, all of these are uh, significant in relation to the intercept, right? So in relation to French here. And then we look at Levenstein distance. We include this in the model to see uh, if it's predicting reaction time. And it looks like as Levenstein distance increases, uh, we know that reaction time does too. Our estimates show here 40.52. This is significant. And so I, I show you on the bottom here, this is just to, to clarify, uh, research question number four, does Levenstein distance affect uh, reaction time to cognates? Yeah, uh, reaction time increases about 80 milliseconds for every one unit increase in Levenstein distance. The unit that I'm working with here, we see in the model, is a half a, a half a distance or a half a Levenstein distance. So we would just multiply that by two, and then that would show us the effect of uh, Levenstein distance on reaction time. Um, not a big question here, but we can ask: Is there a difference in reaction time between non-cognates across languages? There kind of shouldn't be. Uh, if we if we designed the experiment well and we had a good set of words, there shouldn't be. Uh, if everything is equal, but maybe the lexicons themselves, just the, the words are actually different. Um, again, what happens if we look at Levenstein distance? This is giving us Levenstein distance from the Spanish uh, prime to the target in whatever language they were. So average Levenstein distance now for non-cognates here, you can see French still has the highest at like 6.6 .6, and it has the highest reaction time. So Levenstein distance is doing something here. Uh, it's a pretty coarse measure, I have to say, in terms of edit distances, but it's getting us somewhere, which is cool. Um, okay, so the results. Uh, which Romance language should I learn next? Uh, okay, if we include Levenstein distance as a predictor of perceived similarity, like I said before with our hypothesis, um, I guess uh, Portuguese, then Italian and Romanian, knowing that there's no difference in processing between those, uh, and then French, knowing that it's going to be a little bit more effort to process French lexical items um, if you're constantly priming yourself with Spanish. Maybe if you had a word list in Spanish to French, for instance, right? Um, I should say now what I probably should have said before, um, continuing with the inspirations for this, right? It's kind of pop culture along with history of the Spanish language, um, seeing students learn these, this material. 
I've also been asked this question by a lot of students. They come to my office and they ask me like, hey, I put a lot of time in, I know Spanish. Like, uh, I wanna learn another language. Which language should I learn next? And I was speaking to someone about this at the Mental Lexicon Conference, where we published the, the first part of the results to the study. And <laughs> when I was presenting, uh, I finished and the guy said, the audience member said to me, I think learning another language because it's easy is probably the worst reason to learn that language. And I was like, I totally agree. Uh, this is obviously a fun study that we did. We incorporated um, some kind of heavy machinery, right? With experimental design, statistical analysis, a little bit of computer science. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm an applied linguist and I wanna see what we can kind of do with this stuff. So um, I can answer students um, now with some empirical evidence, but I can also again emphasize that, hey, um, Probably your interests uh, will lead you to a, a, a language to learn, right? So a little bit of discussion, uh, and then I'll close because I've been talking for a while. Um, why doesn't lexical similarity work with French, right? Remember how we had lexical similarity. Um, French is at 75% of the lexicon is shared with Spanish, and Romanian is at 71%. Um, why is... French, for instance, yielding longer reaction times. Um, I really think it's the orthography. So in psycholinguistics, we can speak about uh, shallow orthographies and deep orthographies. And French is considered a deep orthography in that if you look at the letter to sound correspondence, it's far from one to one. And so that actually is causing, I think, um, us just to take a little bit more time to process that uh, that information, that input. And then again, if we look at, if we take our heads out of the lab a little bit and we look at uh, orthographic reforms, right? To see um, what, what people have done, um, what organizations have done throughout time, anything from La Real Academia Española to La Academia Francaise, like, right? Um, and seeing the effects of that. Uh, I know that uh, French orthography has not been reformed in some time, and the last, one of the last reforms, um, the reform was made more to maintain etymological, uh, an etymological understanding or a Latin based or kind of, uh, yeah, and it was not based on uh, reducing the depth of the orthography. So um, why doesn't lexical similarity work with French? I think it's the orthography. And then why do reaction times to Portuguese, Italian, and Romanian reflect similar facilitation to Spanish speakers? Uh, I think this is a matter of learned attention. Um, I'll do my best to explain that in one sec. So this is a topic taken up by Nick Ellis uh, and others, but um, uh, Nick is super productive. I think he publishes like an article a month or something. So uh, the idea here, right, is that we learn to focus our attention on certain structures and patterns, and we end up ignoring others. So the orthographic patterns of these three languages, they correlate more with Spanish and French, is my intuition. And therefore, Spanish speakers do not have to make significant adjustments in processing these orthographies successfully. So if we abstract and we look at the orthographic patterns of each language in relation to French, I assume that there's just, the patterns look more similar to someone that knows Spanish. So if I look at Spanish and look at Italian, okay, if I look at Romanian, sure, Portuguese, the same. In French, what do I do? Is kind of the idea. Um, of course, I'm exaggerating a little bit. Remember, these are milliseconds we're talking about here. So um, the idea I have here is that, again, we, we learn to focus on specific structures. You can think about French speakers learning to hear lexical stress in English or another language. It takes time uh, for someone to hear the difference between uh, record and record, for example. And then there's a really cool study by Nick Ellis and Sagarra, um, I think 2010, they did a follow-up in 2011, and they trained uh, Spanish and Chinese speakers uh, to, to they, they trained them on, on, on Latin. And then they gave them an assessment. And what was super cool here is we know Spanish has a rich morphological system, so does Latin. We know that Chinese doesn't do verbal, verbal morphology. They use adverbs and other ways, basically, of, of talking to us about when things, how things, and where things happen. And so 
What was super cool is when they measured the um, how each um, learner was processing Latin, the Chinese speakers were not actually even paying attention to the ends of words and looking for morphological changes that way. They were actually paying attention to adverbs and they were looking for these things and that's how they could tell when the action occurred. And then with respect to tense, which is what they were looking at, the Spanish speakers had no issue looking at the end of Latin words, for instance. So again, we're just kind of focusing ourselves in on certain patterns. And Nick Ellis has used this. It's a bouquet of, of irises, I think, right? And now backing out from language, we take a look at this object and we think flowers. But if you've seen this object before, if you've seen Nick present on this, um, he's showing that, well, we're trained to see flowers, but, and he's speaking about uh, implicit and explicit processes here, but he's like, I can give you a little nudge and say, hey, in the top right, do you see Napoleon? There's a green leaf that says hat, and then if you come down, it's a silhouette profile view, and you can see his nose and chin. Um, and then, of course, there's like Josephine, I think, on the left, for instance, facing us, and also their child that the painter put in here in the center of the picture, kind of down below. So Nick uses this to show that um, we can actually get, uh, we can use explicit teaching, right? And at the same time, he uses this to show that um, when we come to learn a new language, like Portuguese, Romanian, French, we come uh, either with one language or two languages and all the patterns um, of processing that those languages have. Um, this has some implications, uh, both in research and educational implications, but I'm running uh, over what I wanted to speak. And so I'm just going to um, talk about a couple of conclusions and then I'll just, and I'll end. And hopefully we can have, uh, we can have some questions and I'm happy to discuss this for uh, as long as you would like, okay? So um, conclusions. So online language processing accounts, so psycholinguistic accounts, do not necessarily coincide with historical linguistic accounts of lexical similarity. We can use edit distance uh, metrics like Levenstein distance to assess differences in processing. Uh, there is a cognate facilitation effect, not only from L1 to L2, but L2 to L3. Um, and that's about it, right? We know that there's uh, a little bit of extra processing involved in, in, in processing French cognates and the French uh, orthography. But again, these are millisecond uh, differences. And what language should I learn next, regardless of the languages I know? Um, my recommendation would be to pick something that you really like of course. So thank you all very much. Uh, I really appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and just mute myself now and open it up for any questions or feedback from you. Thank you so much. So thank you very much. Um, David, we really appreciate that very interesting um, presentation that you've given us and the interesting research questions that you began with and how you went about it. So um, I'll go ahead and open up um, the session to questions. If anyone has any questions, um, I think you can probably just jump in, but if, if someone else is talking, go ahead and raise your hand or use the reactions tool to do it virtually and I'll call on you. Right. Thank you, David. You can write in the chat also. Um, David, maybe I could start by asking a question here. So um, were the words in the different language, the different target languages that you're given, did they all mean the same thing? Right. Okay. Because you had, you had used the same Spanish words in every single condition, right? So of course they translated and had the same meaning. One thing I was wondering is if there are some statistical tests that you could run to, um, to look at the interaction between the Levenstein measure, the Levenstein distance measure and the target language. So again, as a statistical interaction, is that something that you've already done?
Uh, Scott, thank you so much for the question. Again, thank you all so much for, for your time and attention. Um, so uh, with respect to interactions, um, the model that you saw for research questions number three and onward, let me just scroll back a little bit here. So once we started processing, okay, so let me see, research question. Yeah, so is there a difference in reaction time between cognates across languages? Um, we saw a main effect, right, for Levenstein distance and a main effect for each language. Um, it's not really clear, like, what we mean by by language at this point in time, where that's not very well operationalized, right? Um, I ran this for an interaction to see if maybe, like, Levenstein distance gave you more of a boost in certain languages, right? And there was right. no significant interaction. Ah, uh, interesting. So that suggests, I mean... If that result is generalizable, then then language really doesn't make any difference. It's really more a matter of of the Levenstein distance, right? But I do wonder, though, if you were to do some sort of item analysis, if you would find effects of other variables, such as um, maybe the part of speech of the word or other aspects of semantics, um, things like imageability, you know, like whether the meaning of the word is concrete versus abstract, things like that. I like both of those. I think part of speech is something that uh, we could include imageability too. Um, we did our best to just control the, the word list we had um, for frequency because we know frequency drives a lot of uh, variant. Uh, frequency explains a lot of variance in reaction time. Um, we looked at word length too. Um, and we didn't go further. Uh, we didn't think about imageability. We didn't think about concreteness, for instance. I know those are highly correlated. Uh, and in, in part because the word list we have is um, rather restricted. So think about they can't overlap with English at all. They all have to be cognates with, uh, with four languages. And then the other 30 words have to be non-cognates with four languages. Um, and that took us a little bit of time. So I'm thinking if we constructed, what would be kind of cool to see is construct um, a list of cognates and look at the reaction time um, as a function of Levenstein distance and a few other uh, edit metrics basically, or edit distance metrics to see what type of computations correlate with uh, our behavior. And that would be kind of interesting to me, um, yeah. Thank you. I have one last follow-up question, uh, by the way. I'm also interested in what would happen if you used false cognates? Did you have any false cognates where there's a similarity of form but not meaning? We did not. Um, the thing is, though, and this is why uh, even the semantics of the target language, uh, the meaning of those words is probably insignificant because the uh, participants have no experience in that target language. So they should only have experience with the, the form of it and not the actual meaning. Right. So what I meant actually is what if you were to use, um, let's say a word in Portuguese that looks like an existing Spanish word, but it means something totally different from what you would expect it to mean. I'm just wondering oh, what sort of sure. reaction time effect you might get in that case. So let's use something like a word like uh, exquisite, like uh, exquisito in Spanish, right? Because you have like exquisito. It's not exquisite in Portuguese. It's uh, weird, like something like that, kind of strange. Um, because of the form overlap I, and the lack of semantic knowledge in the target language of Portuguese, I would expect a fast reaction time to that. And they would use that form, I think, to, to, um, to react. Uh, this is kind of what we see, right, with like early second language learners. And I think like uh, Nan Yang, uh, University of Maryland, talked about this a lot, right? Mm -hmm. So he says we're wrapped up kind of in the orthography and the phonology, 
uh, and the associations we make are by sound or by written form. Um, whereas a proficient speaker seems to make uh, semantic associations more. Thank you. Okay, what are your questions? Like what, are you, what are your thoughts about that with, with Portuguese, for instance? I think you have oh. something in mind with like a, a false cognate. Um, would you mind, if you don't mind elaborating on a little bit? Oh, well, some of the research that I've done that has looked at um, how well a person is able to recall a word in a, in a foreign language after having seen it only once um, suggests that, that similarity of form has a much stronger effect than similarity of meaning. And that even these so-called false cognates were things that you could learn pretty quickly in comparison with non-cognates. I mean, that's what, that's what my own research shows, but anyway, we can talk about that later. Oh, that is cool as hell. So basically this is getting research, I'm um, getting learners cognates, and then it's saying, hey, since we're kind of wrapped up in the form anyways, why don't we worry about the non-cognates because you're distracted by them anyways, and then you can learn that set too. Right, yeah, I mean, that's part of it for sure. So I see that uh, Mateo has a question. Mateo, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so first of all, thank you for the talk. It was very interesting. Um, I have kind of two questions um, related to uh, data. So first of all, do you have any uh, information about the linguistics as in the science that we study uh, of the participants? Because as a learner of second languages, I feel that having that background, um, you know, got, got me to touch kind of all the languages that I do not speak, but I've seen maybe several times uh, a certain form or something like that. So do you register at all this information? Oh, that's like a super good question, right? Um, so short answer is yes. Um, participants came into the lab and they filled out a uh, kind of a pre-experiment questionnaire. And that questionnaire is uh, kind of a reduced version of something called the, the LEAP Q, which I think is the like language experience and aptitude questionnaire developed by maybe Marion or Spivey, I can't remember and others um, free to get and use. And so it asks a bunch of language background questions like, um, hey, in a given week, uh, define your language use across you know, writing and reading, across speaking and listening, and then divide it among you know, English and Spanish if those are your two languages. And so we asked participants um, a bunch of questions. And then we also did our best just to um, to actually control as much before we let participants into the lab with the idea that if we have beginners look at this or advanced learners uh, or native speakers, um, we think that's going to affect the, the results. It'll, it'll affect the, the reaction time. Um, and this is so important though, because if we're not paying attention to, this is a really good question. It's like, if we're not paying attention to the, the language background of our participants, uh, I think we can look at a lot of research done in psycholinguistics, like um, kind of in the 90s, in which that wasn't really a, a thing. We were just focusing on averages. And by focusing on um, kind of specific traits, right, that we would expect a learner to have, we can explain more of the variance, more of that dependent variable that we want to, to explain. Mateo, thank you for the question and the, and the kind words. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought that it would have been like an important um, information so um so the second uh question um actually two but still like in the same uh field so um i in in one of the slides i don't think you had numbers so i cannot tell you which one but uh the one in which you actually have um a word and that word was basura um in the italian translation you use scarto but i i'm pretty sure that that's not does not write um, because I think that scarto is desecho, while basura should be spazzatura. So probably is not gonna change. I mean, basura is trash, right? Okay. So I'm I'm not super sure that this would change a lot because from basura to spazzatura, maybe there is the same 
kind of distance. But I just kind of wanted to point it out since I've I've noticed in uh, from the translation in French. Um, and and last thing um, with French, do you think since you talked about, of course, this, um, I think I can say weird orthography of French. Uh, <laughs> Did you think about doing kind of a follow-up experiment by controlling this? So having some words in which the orthography is not as um, not similar, because at the same time um, you you talked about the last re the, the reform in the, uh, uh, by the Académie Française, and actually in the last one that took place like three four years ago, I was an undergrad, so that time um i think that they they actually did a lot of changes to to deal with orthography i i remember onion that they stopped uh, writing with the g and an n and they start doing more similar to the pronunciation and at the same time i was thinking about romanian that probably like you can find a lot of words in which maybe you have a one-to-one -one kind of correspondence but with um characters that are not typical in romance languages so, I mean, did you think about doing some sort of follow-up with the orthography-related information you got? Okay, Mateo, so uh, thanks for the... Thank you for the, the follow-up on that word for, for Scarto. I'll look into that. And yeah, I don't speak Spanish. I should, I should have said that at the beginning. So I base my, I base my that I don't speak Spanish. So I base my um, comment on the translation in uh, in French. So maybe oh, I, no worries, I no worries, not true, but just maybe you want to double check. I mean, this is like a this is a good thing to bring up, right? Because um, looking at word lists that psychologists have used specifically, or psycholinguists have used. Um, I mean, what we're calling a cognate is a cognate in certain word lists, and it's not in other lists. Um, I saw someone give a presentation, and they had the word uh, English to Spanish, like towel, which is toalla. And I mean, that's from Arabic. It's de definitively a cognate to me. I had used that in my study, and I talked to the person about it, and they're like, oh, interesting. So, Mateo, what you bring up is real, man. We need to, to think about these things. What... I also thought was interesting was the kind of like diacritics, right? Or the different characters you might find in anything from like accent marks to like tildes um, across these languages. Uh, the literature, at least that I know of is, or that I understand, is not at all clear on how to score those with respect to an edit distance. So the measure we used, I think was like, if you added a, an accent mark, um, you got a Levenstein distance of 0.5. But that's just our own intuition. And we might be able to work out some sort of internal validity, but we don't have that tested. Um, and so that's actually an area, um, if you're interested in, that I'm sure uh, could use some, some good researching. Okay, thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you for the questions. So we are running a little bit low on time. We're going to be transitioning to our informal student session in just a few moments. And I know that some of the students have some questions for you, but are there any of the instructors or faculty who have any questions for David before we, before I dismiss you and we go to the student session? I'll ask a super quick one if I can, Scott. Yeah, sure. Hi. Uh, so I'm actually building on some, so you mentioned answering to Matteo something about proficiency. But then I was wondering, based on what you were saying to Scott, uh, what from your results suggests to you that proficiency will in, about the um, Spanish would have any kind of effect, right? Because you could imagine, given your experimental design, that all you are getting is just uh, symbolic priming, right? So if you take a, somebody that doesn't know Spanish at all, uh, they might get the same speed up in recall time. Or maybe you have a control for that. And that would be cool. Um, um, but so that, that it's just a speculation question, right? Since you me measure proficiency, I was wondering whether there is something already in your results that suggests that proficiency in Spanish helps or not, because I would have guessed, yeah, maybe it's just orthographic differences, then it doesn't matter whether you speak 
Spanish or not? Yeah, so um, let me think about this for a second. So I guess the idea is, um, can you use your second language, right, as a, a helper here? And we could set up another experiment in which we looked at like novice learners, intermediate learners, and advanced learners. And then we would see, we could compare the differences like between the groups. Um, I would expect the advanced learners, uh, given my knowledge of just cognitive psychology and like expert learners, uh, not to like go to Malcolm Gladwell's like 10,000 rule thing, but it affects uh, how you look at something and how and then how you process that something, probably based because of how you have that something represented in your head. So I would hypothesize that um, while the novice learners were only seen in orthographic or a kind of a form effect, the intermediate learners who do have uh, years of, of language experience, over 500 hours of language instruction, over 600 hours of language instruction, um, I think they, they would be able to use those. Um, and then I think someone that kn has, knows the language even more uh, and knows more of words, for instance, would uh, have that effect would, 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 would increase. That would be my hypothesis, at least. Right. I mean, that's a good hypothesis, right? It would be interesting to check because my, na I don't do lexical psychology, but my, my, my naive impression, since we know that this kind of pr symbolic priming effects are very easily easy to get in recall times um, would be that it, maybe it's just that, right? And so, um, yeah, they, it would be cool to be able to see whether there is an actual language effect underlyingly or not. Yeah, what, what comes to mind, um, just to, to close is a previous study we looked at uh, was English to Spanish and we used masked priming uh, so we're hiding the prime in about a 50 millisecond uh, SOA for synchronous onset uh, or yeah, stimulus onset asynchrony. And we looked at novice learners, intermediate and advanced learners of Spanish. And then we, we primed them in, in English to see if they could use their, their English prime. Um, they should know English really well, right? Um, and what was really interesting, this is why you might be onto something is that um, what correlated really well with the mass prime was um, spelling ability. So if you were like, if you paid attention to like the form, for instance, like that mass prime meant a lot to you. And so, yeah, you might be under something there with the kind of like form overlap. I think what's going on here is a combination of form and meaning. And that's why they're able to perform much better on the cognate set as opposed to the non-cognate set. Um, but I mean, yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Aniello, for that question. Um, good. So we're going to go ahead and transition into the informal student session now. Um, those of you who will be, so I'm going to dismiss the faculty and instructors and staff at this point. Um, but let's give David a, a hand, uh, either a virtual one or an actual one before you leave. Thank you so much, David. This was very interesting. Important things oh, to think really, about. Thank you all so much. I, uh, I'm very grateful to present for you. And if you have any follow-up questions, um, just please let me know. Hopefully that contact information came through. And if not, I can put it into the, into the chat. I'm happy to help out with anything I can. And just please take care. <laughs>